بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد all praise due to Allah and His praise and blessings and peace be upon our Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم Inshallah in the next few weeks we will be explaining the ahadith in a chapter from a book called بلوغ المرام by الحافظ بن حجر رحمه الله which we've been, stud- uh, been studying for a while now uh, here uh, in Clear Lake Islamic Center in Houston, Texas. Um, and uh, we uh, studying the last chapter of the book called Al Jami', the collections. Uh, and this is a collection of different topics and uh, important subjects, mainly related to uh, etiquettes and uh, morality and. Uh, Uh, social interactions and also spirituality and the new chapter that we'll be studying inshallah ta'ala is about az-zuhd and i name it uh, minimalism uh, which is uh, focus on um, how can you uh, even though when you have less you can have more Uh, even though when uh, you understand the difference between Uh, quantity and quality. Uh, Az-Zuhd never meant that less in quality, but uh, usually many means less in quantity. Uh, it means that you take what you need and you don't take over what you need. It means that you uh, not to connect your heart to the dunya as much as you connect your heart to the akhirah. So this chapter is about Az-Zuhd wal-Wara. It's called Az-Zuhd wal-Wara, as Ibn Hajar rahimahullah call it. And he put them together, and it's a very unique combination because they both go hand to hand. Az Zuhd in Arabic language uh, uh, means at-taqallul min al-shay. The, the word Zuhd, Zahada in Arabic language, it means when you have less, minimalism. Yani you have the minimum, you reduce. So, as Salaf rahimahumullah have defined Az Zuhd in many different ways. And there is many different definition, de- definitions for the word az-zuhd. Uh, and one of the most common definition for az-zuhd, uh, which is I would like to share with you tonight, is az-zuhdu tarkul haram. To avoid what is haram. So minimalism or az-zuhd, it means is to leave what is haram. To leave what is unlawful. وَأَن تَكُونَ فِي مَا فِي يَدِ اللَّهِ أَوْثَقُ مِنْكَ بِمَا فِي يَدِكَ And you have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for you than what you have in your hand. So you trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than yourself. Some other scholars قالوا الزهد هو النظر إلى الدنيا بعين الزوال ليسهل عليك الإعراض عنها. is always to remember, as zuhd it means, you always remember that this life is short and temporary and will come to an end soon. So if this is the, if this is, is that's what as zuhd is, that, under, that feeling, that understanding. And if you have that, you will find yourself, you know, less attached to it. And you are ready to depart from it uh, to the next uh, one. Also was said, هو عزوف القلب عن الدنيا بلا تكلف. It's when your heart is not attached to this worldly life, without any exaggeration. Uh, and it means that your heart focus and attach on the things that will benefit you in the akhirah, and will not be attached in this to things in this life. that it will not benefit you in the Akhir. And we see from ourselves that we are so attached to so many hobbies and desires and things in this life, uh, materialistic things in this life, and uh, entertainment, different type of entertainment, uh, uh, and joys uh, uh, in this life that not necessarily would help, would, it will help us in the Akhir. And here I'm not talking about the haram only, talking about the things that is even lawful, but it will not benefit you in the akhirah. So they said, az-zuhd is when your heart not attached to these things. Uh, uh, so that means you avoid 
the haram, because the haram will not help you in the akhirah. And you're also the dislike things, the makruhat, and also you're not attached to the permissible things, al-mubahat as well. And that means you will not be attached to any of these things. So, and because of your heart not attached to it, you will not be talking much about it, you will not be doing much of it, <coughs> and you will not, uh, and you will have an attitude that it always drives you towards the akhirah, not to the dunya. Drives you up, not down. Uh, uh, that's why Sheikh al-Islam rahimahullah said, Az-Zuhd ibn Taymiyyah said, Az-Zuhd tarku al-raghbati fi ma la yanfa'u fi al-akhirah. That you have no interest in what will not benefit you in the akhirah. You might have it, but your, your heart is not interested in it. And you're looking forward for it. And you search for it. And you, when they talk about Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, they said, when people talk about worldly things, he was never ever seen ever in his life getting excited and asking too many questions about it or, or anything like that. The one time they heard him talk about something related to this worldly life, somebody mentioned something about a, a, a masjid that was constructed in a very unique way. Then he asked, how was constructed and what type of materials it was built with. They said that's the only thing we heard from Muhammad related to worldly matters. And even that one was related to a masjid who was built. Uh, uh, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah once was asked, أَيَكُونُ الرَّجُلُ زَاهِدًا وَعِنْدَهُ أَلْفُ دينار? If I have 1,000 dinar pieces of gold, can that person who possesses that large amount of money be a zahid, be an ascetic. قَالَ إِنْ كَانَ لَا يَفْرَحْ إِذَا زَادَتْ وَلَا يَحْزَنْ إِذَا نَقَصَتْ If that person wouldn't get very happy if it, go, if it become, uh, if it increased, nor he will be sad if it decreased. In another word, his heart not attached to the money. Other it will be zuhd. That's a zahid. And as you see, that's not an easy thing. That's a level, it is hard, it's not for, uh, it is not for something that necessarily, uh, uh, you might have it for a short period of time. You might have it uh, towards certain things in your life. But can you imagine to have this all the time for everything? That's, that's hard. That's why a zuhad are few. This is a very high level. This is a very high level in, 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 in religiosity. Uh, those who have a great deal of patience, of sabr. That's the one who achieved that. Al-wara, which is the other word uh, that the Imam Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, used to give as a title for this chapter. Al-wara, it means to abstain from something. So al-zuhd is to reduce. Al-wara is to abstain, is to leave. And in Sharia, al-wara is to avoid the doubtful matters. Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah said, al-wara is something so clear and so simple. He said, simple? What is that? He said, anything that you're doubtful about, leave it. Ma haka fi sadrik fatruk. That's why one of the early uh, uh, scholars said لا يبلغ العبد حقيقة التقوى you will not achieve the true meaning of taqwa the true meaning of taqwa until you leave and تترك ما لا بأس به حذرا مما به بأس that you leave what you know nothing wrong in it because it might lead you to something wrong. So I know this is haram, it's not haram. But I leave it because it can open the door for me to fall into something haram. So, in another word, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah has a nice way to put it. He said, az-zuhd is to avoid what will not benefit you in the akhirah. But al-wara is to avoid what will harm you in the akhirah. So the first one to avoid what will not benefit you in the akhirah, in the next life, in the hereafter. 
But al-wara' is to avoid what it might harm you in the hereafter. Al-wara' is based on knowledge. Based on knowledge. The knowledge of what? The best of the two. And uh, more evil. So you avoid, al-wara' is to avoid what is more evil. Al-wara' is to care for what's more rewarding. Al-wara' to avoid what can be doubtful. Okay? Al-zuhd and al-wara', these two words, they have nothing to do with the rules of sharia, which is categorized as obligations or recommendations. Anything the Sharia ah obligated uh, uh, obligate us to do or recommend us to do. So if it is wajib as a as an obligatory uh, uh, upon us, or it is recommended upon us, there is no zuhd, there is no wara. Nobody said, "Well, I have wara. I'm not going to pray dhuhr today." Or you know what? I'm going to have zuhd. Khalas, no need for praying sunnah. <laughs> Reduce the mother salah. No, al wara. And as a zuhd has nothing to do with what's wajib and what is mustahab. But it has to do with what is haram. Al wara' to avoid the haram. Al wara' a zuhd is to avoid the haram. Al wara' is to avoid the dislike. A zuhd is to avoid and not to be attached and interested in what things that is dislike or not recommended. Also, al mubahat, what is permissible. A zuhd is to avoid it. Al-wara is to leave it. Tayyip. Uh, uh, as for, sorry, as zuhd is to avoid the permissibles. But there is no wara has to do with permissibles. Nobody can say, you know what, I will have wara. So I'm not going to eat, you know, uh, 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 or not drink cold water because of its wara. You know what, I wara, I'm going to avoid its haram. I'm not going to drink any more soda because it might be haram. No, that's not allowed. But a zuhd, you know what? I don't want to be attached and addicted to caffeines and addicted to things of that nature. You know, I want to be, you know, to reduce the amount of wasting my money and spending money on things like outside, or eating restaurants and stuff like that. It's zuhd. Al-wara. You know, zuhd, I'm not going to buy a fancy car. But there is no wara. Wallahi, I'm afraid that can, uh, 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 you know, these fancy cars haram. No, that's no wara. Al-wara is not related to permissibles. Al-zuhd is related to permissible things in Islam. Mubahat. Tayyip. So remember, al-zuhd is to leave what will not benefit you. Al-wara is to leave what you think it is harmful. For you in the akhirah. Uh, that's why, if, if this is clear, you'll understand that a zuhd is what is higher level than al wara. A zuhd is higher level than wara. Because a zuhd is to avoid what will harm you, but also you avoid what will not benefit you. That's a higher level. Uh, now let's start with the uh, first hadith. عن النعمان بن بشير رضي الله عنهما قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول وأهوى النعمان بأصبعيه إلى أذنيه هكذا يعني النعمان قال إن الحلال بين وإن الحرام بين وبينه مشتبهات لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس فمن اتقى الشبهات فقد استبرأ لدينه وعرضه ومن وقع في الشبهات وقع في الحرام كالراعي يرعى حول الحما يوشك أن يقع فيه ألا وإن لكل, حما لكل ملك حما ألا وإن حما الله محارمه ألا وإن في الجسد مضغة إذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله وإذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله ألا وهي القلب متفق عليه Nu'man ibn Bashir رضي الله عنه, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, said, I heard Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He said what? I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Nu'man pointed 
his two fingers to his ears. You know, like I heard. So he's saying, I heard with my ear the Prophet وسلم, saying, both lawful halal and unlawful things haram are clear, evident. But in between them, there are doubtful things. Most people have no knowledge about them. And yani you have no knowledge about these doubtful matters. What's the real ruling in regard to them? Is it halal or it's haram? Is it allowed or not allowed? So he who saves himself from these doubtful things, saves his religion and his honor. And he keep them blameless. And he who indulges in these doubtful things is like a shepherd who pastures his animals near the hima. What's your hima? Hima, it's a private pasture or a private area, a designated area, a private property, okay, of someone else. And at any moment, he is labeled to get in it. O oh, people, be aware. Every king has hima, has this private protected, you know, uh, uh, grassland for his cattle. Every king has hima, this protected area. And the hima of Allah on this earth is what he declared unlawful, haram. Don't fall into it. Don't cross the line to it. Be aware in the body. There is a piece of flesh. If it becomes sound and healthy, the whole body becomes sound and healthy. But if it gets corrupt, spoiled, the whole body gets spoiled and corrupt. And that is the heart. Muttafaqun alayh, agreed upon, reported by Bukhari Muslim, both agreed to report it from An-Nu'man ibn Bashir uh, This hadith is very clear related to the chapter, talking about al-wara' to avoid the doubtful matters. That's right. And the relationship between al-wara' and al-zuhd is clear. Because al-zuhd is when your heart not attached to the dunya. And when your heart not attached to this worldly life, it became easy for you to avoid the doubtful matters. The reason for people to do the doubtful matters, because they want to fulfill their desires. Because they are so attracted to the dunya. So whenever you learn how to avoid the dunya and your heart attached to the akhirah, it became so easy for you to have wara, to avoid the things that you know it is doubtful and harmful, could be harmful. As zuhd as you heard earlier, me saying, is to avoid what is haram. And to leave what will not benefit you. And obviously, to leave what will might harm you as well. And this hadith is clear. Al-Hadith is talking about to avoid the thing that it will not benefit you. And it might even harm you in the akhir, which is these doubtful matters. And also talking about the hadith, talk about the qalb, the corruptions of the heart and the soundness of the heart. And that's where the whole entire concept of zuhd comes from. A zuhd is, 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 is one of the actions of the heart. It's not how you dress. It's not how, uh, uh, what you write necessarily. It is what's in your heart. There are so many people they have nothing and they have not much of the dunya, but their heart so attached to it. And there are so many people who have much less in this dunya, but guess what? Their hearts somewhere in the akhir. And you look at Umar and Abu Bakr radiallahu an, they were businessmen, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Uthman ibn Affan. These were rich companions. But guess what? Their hearts was, they were heart attached to the akhir. In Nabi Sallallahu at one point he will have a lot of money and he will give it all out because his heart never was attached to it, to the dunya and to the wealth of this life. 
صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم um, This uh, hadith reported by Bukhari and Muslim and agreed upon from Nu'mad Mashir and you see this is a very authentic hadith and the narration that Ibn Hajar mentioned here is the narration of Muslim rahimahullah Muslim have an addition uh, uh, other than Al-Bukhari which is he said that Nu'man pointed with his two fingers to his ear uh, what that means what's the benefit of Nu'man al Mashir saying that you know uh, it is in Muslim rahimahullah put that particular narration in his Sahih uh, uh, and that's all thing that make Sahih Muslim is very unique and give it an advantage sometimes over Al-Bukhari the way he, he narrated the hadith and collect the narrations. Uh, because uh, this uh, uh, extra information shows us that the Nu'man heard it directly from the Prophet ﷺ. Because sometimes the Sahaba عنهم, will say the Prophet ﷺ said that, but not necessarily that they themselves witness it. They themselves heard it or saw the Prophet ﷺ. Many times Ibn Abbas will tell us about things happen in Mecca happened in uh, uh, before hijrah and ibn abbas عنه, even wasn't born at that time but he heard that from other companions uh, and that will be absolutely acceptable and absolutely uh, authentic uh, because all the sahaba are equally uh, trustworthy but here when ibn Ashir said that we know that he himself heard it from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam i'm saying this because some of the uh, scholars of hadith like Al-Waqidi rahimahullah uh, denied that uh, 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 Nu'man ibn Bashir heard anything from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because Nu'man ibn Bashir was eight years old when the Prophet sallallahu died. Uh, so uh, that means what? That means that this hadith among the latest narrations or the hadith that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi said and one of the advices that the Prophet ﷺ gave right before his death. Because if Nu'man Mashir said, I heard that with my ear, and Nu'man Mashir was eight years when uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ died, that means uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that a year or uh, uh, two before he died. Yet Nu'man was about seven or eight years old when he heard that to remember this hadith. Uh, so it means it's one of the latest things that, or one of the uh, uh, advices that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi gave in the end of his life Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which would give it even more value. Uh, it means that it's one of the muhkamat, one of the uh, muhkam uh, rulings and muhkam uh, uh, advices, never abrogated, uh, 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 no exception was made to it. It's clear. It's important. In order that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam want to leave it behind him uh, right before he died, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. He said, بَيْنَهُمَا أُمُورٌ مشتبهات. In between the Haram and Haram, things which are مشتبهات. Okay? مشتبهات. Also, it could be said, uh, مشبهات. So you have mushtabihat, mushbihat, and this narration came in Sayyid uh, Muslim. Mushbihat, uh, yani uh, not clear, okay? Mushtabihat, uh, the same concept, not clear, where you have uh, uh, evidence that uh, uh, give different conclusion. So this matter, there is evidence support uh, uh, the idea that this thing is halal. But you look at from another perspective, with another evidence, support that this thing is haram. So you didn't know. Is it allowed or not allowed? Is it good or bad? It kind of confused to understand it. Um, in this case, that's where the Prophet said, avoid it. That's what is al-wara. لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس No, uh, not many people know the ruling in regard to these issues. Only few people know the rulings. Be attention. It doesn't mean لا يعلمهن يعني not most of the people don't know that they are doubtful matters. No. The people know that they are doubtful matters. But most of the people don't know the rulings or the correct understanding of it. 
the correct ruling related uh, to it. So in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi whoever avoided istabra'a li dinihi wa irdih. That person who avoid this matter will save and protect istabra'a min al bara'a yani ihtat protect okay uh, uh, protect himself free himself from falling into something wrong uh, uh, protect his deen his faith and iman and irdi his honor why because people will not talk about you will not say bad things about you for example there is certain type of drinks okay there were debate among the scholars about it if it is lawful or unlawful is it halal or is considered khamar and it can be a borderline so if someone didn't care and start consuming this other people might see him drinking it smell it from him and they would say oh my god this guy is drunk this guy, you know, he drinks. This guy, he does this or that. You know, he's not good. He's fasting. He's alcoholic. You don't want that. So you want to protect your honor. So falling into this haram could lead that people say bad things about you. And accusing of you of things which is not necessarily to be true. So in Nabi Sallallahu said, avoid these things so you protect your honor. You protect your deen as well. فَمَنِ taqa Avoid. And it taqwa, it means taking protection. You avoid it. You completely avoid it. You just not avoid it. It taqa is a stronger than the word avoid. It taqa is a stronger than the word ibta'at. It taqa, it means you carefully protect yourself. Tactically, you're very tactful, tactful. You're very careful. You, uh, you, you, you plan. You worry about it, and that's why you protect yourself from it. Ittaqa is a beautiful word. You protect yourself carefully from these doubtful men. Then he said, "Sallallahu and those who don't. وَقَعَ فِي الْحَرَامِ وَقَعَ فِي الشُّبُهَاتِ Those who fall into these doubtful matters will fall into the haram. And I love this word, وَقَعَ Fall. It's a, it's a beautiful way of saying it. Fall in it. And the word fall, it means that you fall. You go down. You don't rise by doing the doubtful matter. تَدُلْ عَلَى السُّقُوطِ وَالذَّمْ وَالْإِنْحِطَاطِ it, 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 it give a negative, you know, uh, uh, connotation uh, to the in relation to the person who do that. That like he fall down, uh, he fall off, uh, uh, he basically going down uh, with these ten sins uh, and and these matters instead of rising and, and going up and high. Also, uh, uh, falling it means like you go deep into it. It gives you a, good, a lot of good meanings, this word. So whenever you get into the habit of falling into this doubtful matter, and you don't care, you just fall, fall in it, you will fall into the haram without you realizing. Because you do, when you fall, you have no control. You know, when you jump and you fall from a cliff down, usually you don't guarantee that you will fall in this particular spot. So what happens when you start doing these doubtful matter? You're falling, you can control yourself, and you will find yourself doing the haram, and you might you find yourself doing even the kaba'ir, the major sins. Then in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam give an example to make it something uh, you can visualize. And he gave an example of something very relevant to the people that he was talking to, which is the companions at that time. Telling them, because they are very familiar with the concept of al hima and the concept of shepherd who, uh, who take their herds uh, uh, outside uh, to feed them. There will be an area, a protected area. And this protected area owns usually by people, usually kings, uh, head of tribes, 
powerful family and they basically have it protected and nobody can uh, 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 bring their herds or sheep or cattle to it. So that's why it's always green, the grass is, is good. So here, if you bring your herd and the sheep and the, and the, and the goats and, and, and the cattle around that area, which is designated a protected area, and there is no fence. It's just known that this area belonged to Sonso. And you let your herds around it. What will happen? The herd, naturally, because they don't understand the concept of this protecting land, this belong to this person, not belong to that person. They don't know. What they will do, they will be attracted by the water and the granary of the grass and how healthy the grass is. And you will find yourself, your herds, start eating from there. What happened in the old days, if you cross the line of somebody's king and you start your herds eating from somebody else's land's protected land? They kill the animal. They shoot them and they kill them. They will be destroyed. And here, the example, when you start going into the doubtful matter and you fall into haram, what happened? You destroy yourself because you go to hellfire. Like these animals destroyed themselves by going and eating from the protected area that belonged to the king. As this animal will be slaughtered, you basically, you're leading yourself to its destruction in the akhirah by going to the hellfire because you fall into the haram. So, uh, then in Nabi Sallallahu talked about something in the end of the hadith, warning people and paying people, making people to pay attention to the heart. The soundness of the heart uh, 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 is so important. And the corruption of the heart is so dangerous. And, and your heart is the base for your action. And it's interesting, and Nabi Sallallahu brought this because really, the person who, because it's easy for you to say, oh, it's not doubtful matter, it's clear to me. The only one knows about this is Allah and also your heart. You're, you know from inside if this is doubtful matter to you or not. You know in your heart this halal haram. So it all starts from here. That's what will prevent you from crossing that line and falling into the haram and falling into the doubtful matter. It needs a great deal of will, great deal of sincerity, a great deal of attaching to the akhirah. Love for Allah more than the love for the dunya. Patience. Trust. Uh, 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 putting your trust and you depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all this comes from this heart. The more your heart is sound, the more your actions will be sound. The more your heart is corrupt and weak and, 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 and uh, sick, uh, the weaker your actions will be. And the slower and the farther you are from Al-Jannah and from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mudra. The word mudra is like the, the food that you chew. You know, piece of flesh, which is the heart, this muscle. Saluhat, Salahat, sorry, in the hadith. But also you can read it Saluhat. You can say Saluhat with Dhamma or Salahat with Fatha. But uh, with Fatha, uh, is more uh, uh, accurate, or not accurate, afsah, yani it's, 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 it's much better, more eloquent, or much better. Uh, uh, and the salah is the opposite of al fasad, corruption. Uh, let's see what can we, what are the uh, benefits and lessons from this hadith. Number one, al ulama rahimahumullah agreed that this is one of the greatest hadith in Islam. As a matter of fact, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah said, the whole entire religion of Islam is based on three hadith. This is one of them. The first hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ These are based on intention. And the second one, uh, 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 those whoever invented matters not from the religion, uh, is not uh, from it. And he said, this is the third one. الْحَلَالُ بَيْنُ الْحَرَامُ بَيْنُ 
And uh, some ulama like Abu Dawood uh, 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 said, uh, no, uh, there are four ahadith, al Islam is based on it. Four ahadith. The three that I mentioned, and they added, min husni Islam al mar tarkuhu mala yani. It is from the good Islam, the good. Uh, uh, the, 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 the good iman of the person that the person will avoid uh, the matter that is not uh, of his concern and, and some said no uh, it is لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخي ما يحب لنفسه and to love for your brother what you love for yourself uh, regardless uh, it is one of three or one of four most important hadith in Islam so I'm glad that we get chance to comment on it and it's one of the hadith that an Imam Nuhi rahimahullah mentioned as the hadith of the principles of Islam, the 40 hadith that he chose as the most important 40 hadith in Islam. Uh, also from this hadith we learn that uh, uh, the truth will always be recognized. Uh, uh, that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not uh, many people know the doubtful matter, the ruling of the doubtful, but there will be always people know the ruling in regard to these doubtful matter. So there is nothing in Sharia or in Islam will be completely not known to people. There will be always there is a scholar, even there are few, who will understand it and who will know the uh, rules of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regard to this matter. And will say that the right, will come to right, arrive to the right conclusion. The issue of tashabuh, the issue of doubtful, this being a doubtful matter, it's a, it's a relevant issue. So it can be doubtful to someone and not doubtful to other. It can be doubtful to this person but not doubtful to me. And I give you an example, a real example in life. I have some of my colleagues and friends who are very doubtful about the issue of eating from the meat uh, in the public uh, uh, market in the West or in the United States. Can I eat just uh, meat from the stores or from Wendy's or, uh, uh, you know, fast food or Chick-fil-A or whatever? You know, I'm not making advertising for anybody here. But uh, can I eat just from the public uh, places, restaurants? Or I only eat from the meat that slaughtered by Muslims and known as halal. So there is people, clear for them, this is haram and I don't eat it. But those people are doubtful. I'm not sure, I heard good argument here, good argument there. So those people should what? Should avoid this matter. But there is other people for them, it is so clear that it is halal. And I, I do believe that. SubhanAllah, no matter how much I read the other side of the argument, for me, it is so clear that it is allowed. That's why somebody once told me, Shaykh, why didn't you just avoid it? Because it's doubtful. For me, it's not doubtful at all. It's as halal as, as drinking water. And I might have some doubtful about certain countries, and in these countries I don't eat from public uh, meat, or public stores, or restaurants, or certain type of meat. So here, it, it can be, uh, you can be doubtful about certain things, and you might not be. There is the opposite. There are certain areas for me are very doubtful. For those colleagues of mine, who are very doubtful about the meat, for them it is so clear cut and it is halal or it is haram. For me, you know, no, I, I'm confused and I avoid it. So what I'm trying to say is this certain doubtful matter can be at one point doubtful and cleared up. It also can stay doubtful for you forever. And for some people versus others. It might be two people have complete two different outcomes. And it's always related to your heart. Uh, 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 you the one who, at the end of the day, judge that. If it's really doubtful to you or it's clear, and I'm confident, I trust this item, I trust this scholar, and you know what, I just follow him. 
سمع علماء رحمه الله مثل الإمام أحمد رحمه الله وإسحاق he's known as Ibn Rahawi but he didn't like this name Rahawi that's why Imam Ahmed Rahimahullah when he used to mention him he said Ishaq ibn Ibrahim قال ما عبر إلينا النهر أحسن من إبراهيم إسحاق ibn Ibrahim وكنا نخالف في الشاء there's no better man cross the river to us better than Ishaq ibn Ibrahim even though we disagree with certain things with him Ishaq ibn Ibrahim al-Hanbali Rahimahullah great scholars in the same level of Imam Ahmed Rahimahullah he lived in, he's in the same time, he lived in the same time uh, of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. They both said the mushtabih issues are the issues that the Sahaba debated over. And the ulama debated over it is haram or it is halal. These are the mushtabihat. If there is an issue, Sahaba debated over halal, haram, you should avoid it. Or the ulama, the early scholars debated, some said halal, some said haram, these are the ones that you should avoid. But I don't think you can generalize that because there's too many things. There is a difference of opinions between halal and haram among the early scholars about so many things that can be clearly known that the right opinion is this versus that because there is a clear evidence to support that position. Uh, but it could be for certain people very doubtful matter. Um, it's like the debate over certain type of drinks, certain type of food, animals is allowed to eat or not, um, business transactions, and so forth. So Al-Ulama said the issue that also the Adam will say, I have no position, I don't know the rule in it. When a great scholar said, I don't know the rule in this because it's very confusing. I will just avoid talking about it. I have no comment on it. They said, this is the issue that you should avoid. So when the issue have a different evidence and, and uh, uh, they contradict each other and you can't come to a conclusion, this is the issue that you should avoid. Uh, for the average person, I'm not looking into the evidence and when I found the scholars debated over something, Sheikh Walid said it is haram. Uh, and Sheikh uh, uh, Ibrahim or Sheikh Ahmed said it is haram. Uh, and both I respect, both I trust, and both equal for me in ilm, and so forth. What should I do? We said in this case, when you see it so doubtful like this, that's what you avoid. Type, I don't have this, but I was told by some people that this is haram. You know what? I was told that this type of business transaction, leasing cars is haram. Then I go and ask Sheikh, for example, so and so, Ya Sheikh Walid or Sheikh Salah Sawi in Houston, is leasing cars halal? Yes, it is halal. As long as it is just a, a lease contract. In this case, can you say, oh, there is doubtful matter? No, you ask a senior scholar, the alim, and he told you it's halal. You're not going to leave that for a WhatsApp message for somebody you don't know who he is. So, here, that doubt is not any more doubtful matter. Otherwise, we're not going to do anything if this is, will be the case. Any different opinions that you hear. Or you had a debate over this and you were doubtful about it. But you talked to a scholars and he clarified for you. And he explained to you why it is halal, why it is haram. Halal is not any more a doubtful matter. But before asking, it's a doubtful matter you avoid contradicting opinions and you didn't arrive to a conclusion, you don't feel comfortable, it's a doubtful matter you avoid. Why doubtful matters are exist? SubhanAllah, yani, this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first of all. Allah, put, Allah could have made everything so clear, black and white. But Allah didn't do it this way. First of all, because it gives flexibility in Sharia and room for opinions. Number two, it's a test for people to test their taqwa, to test their fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also it gives a room for people to make their ishtihad, their own opinion and their understanding. These doubtful matters happen because of the evidence. Sometimes the evidence it can appear as if it contradicts each other. So you need, the scholars will 
look at these evidence from different, understand them also in a different ways. For example, in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, uh, it is wajib to have a shower on Friday. Is it wajib means must or it is recommended? So it's haram not to take a shower or it is just recommended to take a shower? So understanding the text and the wording, what exactly it means, that can be a challenge and lead to these, ex the existence of these doubtful matters. Sometimes the doubtful, ma doubtful matter happen because the scholars don't know all the evidence related to the subject. They didn't reach them. They didn't know about it. Uh, uh, the doubtful matter happens for the average Muslims or the common uh, person uh, due to the different fatwas by the scholars. And in my opinion, one of the reasons of doubtful matters to happen, especially in these days and the increased number of them to these days, is because of the increase of ignorance. People don't understand the Sharia, don't understand the evidence, don't understand the Quran and the Sunnah. And don't understand also the matter itself. So the ulama, this will be a doubtful matter because the alim can't understand this business transaction and understand what it exactly means, what it really entails, and so forth. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, whoever do the doubtful matters, fall into the haram. What that means, fall into the haram? Waqa'a fil haram. It means that doing the doubtful matter in itself a haram thing. So because of that, you have committed sin. You see? Waqa'a fil haram. So it is doubtful. But you know what? I didn't avoid, avoid it. I did it. You know, this business transaction, some people say haram, haram, I'm confused. You know what? I just signed the contract. I did not take the advice of the Prophet, avoid the doubtful matter. Is doing the doubtful matter means waqa'a fil haram, yani the person committed the haram? Or it means doing the doubtful matters will lead you eventually to fall into the haram. Both. According to many of the scholars, both. So that means avoiding the doubtful matter is not just a recommended thing, it's a wajib. Because protecting your deen and your honor is wajib. That's why he said, if you do that, you protect your deen and you protect... One of the lessons from and this one of the hadith is a dalil, a proof on the concept of siddu dhara'i. You have to protect your deed. Things that can lead to the haram should be avoided. And it's not just not recommended, should, it must be avoided. Uh, this hadith shows us an important point. That Islam does not only want us, wants us, not to do the haram, but also to stay away from the haram. And these two different things. One level is not to do the haram. But another level not even to come near the haram. That's why many things in Sharia, Allah SWT said, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina." Don't come near adultery. That's why you're not allowed to hug and kiss a woman that is not allowed for you to touch. Not allowed to be with her alone. We'll spend the night together in a hotel room. We're not related to each other. That's why uh, 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 Sharia, for example, said don't sit in a gathering where alcohol is served or drugs are, are, are used. You avoid such gathering. You're not doing the haram. But you don't come near the haram. You stay away from that. Like when you have your herd, you don't say, you know what, this land is the protected land, but I'm going to be just right here. You know, five inches far or five feet far. No, you stay far away because you can't control. This hadith tells us that we've been ordered to protect our deen. 
And nothing can affect your deen negatively like sins. That will reduce your capital from your spirituality. A shirk will take it completely away. But a sin, the sins will reduce it. That's your backbone. That's something you should care for it so much. That's what Hassan Basri used to say. Ya ibn Adam, deenuk deenuk, innama huwa shahmuk wa damuk. Son of Adam, your deen is your flesh, is your blood. This is how much you care about your blood. You know, when you injure yourself, you cut yourself, when your blood starts gushing, you just say, oh, mashallah, it looks nice, you know. I like the color. No, you immediately stop the blood. You care for it not to lose it. That's right. That's your deen, you care for it, to hold to it so, so tight, so you don't lose your deen. You don't lose your iman. Also this hadith uh, is a base for something Al-Ulama rahimahullah said. It's recommended, it's not wajib, which is Al-Khuruj min Al-Khilaf. Whenever you find a debate between scholars over something, it's always better and recommended for you to choose the safe side. It is better to choose the safe side. For you as a person, I ask, I'm traveling. One alim told me the opinion of Al Jumhur, the, the form of that. If you stay four days, you're allowed to shorten the salah. Beyond four days, you're not allowed to shorten the salah. Another fuqaha said, you have up to 15 days. If you're staying more than 15 days, you can't shorten the salah. But if you're staying maximum 15 days, and you will leave, uh, you're not staying more than 15 days, you are allowed to shorten the salah. And the third opinion by Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, and one opinion among the Hanabira, they said you are allowed to shorten the salah in traveling until you come back to your country, to come back to your residence place. Even if you stay a year, you are allowed. Okay, so here, these three opinions. It's recommended for you to get out of the khilaf. How you get out of the khilaf? All these fuqaha agree that after the four days, if you pray for rak'ah, you get. Even those who said you can shorten the prayer uh, up to a year, or, uh, up to whatever amount of time until you come back to your country. But if you tell the scholar Ibn Taymiyyah and those who took that position, what if I want to pray the four, the dhuhr four rak'ah, not two? I'm not going to show you the salah. They'll tell you your salah is correct. So everybody agree your salah is correct. So they said, in this case, I get out of the khilaf. I go to the opinion that unified all of them, as long as that opinion, you know, recognized by the scholars. You don't make your own opinion. No, it's one of the opinions that everybody will agree upon. That's recommended for you. For you as a person. But for me as a mufti, I can't do that. For me as a mufti, I only give you what I believe is the correct opinion. Unless I give fatwa for an institute or a country or a president or a leader that I give them an opinion that can unify the society. For an individual, if you ask me about the salah, I'll tell you that's the rule that I believe in. One of the lessons from this hadith, that also the person as he or she asked to protect their deen, they must protect their honor. And that's important. You should care not to put yourself in a position where people speak ill of you or think bad about yourself. Don't do the things that provoke others, that invite others to speak about you, or to make you in a position that you're suspicious. Don't make things make you a suspicious person. I give you an example. Somebody was asking you recently. Let's say I am the Imam of here in the Masjid Clearly Exam Center. Then we have this uh, office in the building we want to rent so I come and I rent it 
and I make a business there. And that business serves the masjid and serves the community. Even if this business is completely pure and completely transparent, but it opened the door for people to speak about me. Oh, he's making business out of the masjid. He's making business out of the masjid. He's making business out of that, uh, uh, his work. You know, we give, we support the master, it's non-profit for him to make some money. You don't put yourself in a position like that. You know what? I hire my daughter, and I hire my wife, and I hire my cousins, and I have my this. I... That's open the door for people to accuse you. You always try to avoid the thing that, that make your honor in a position where people speak about you. It's a wisdom. This hadith shows the connection between the heart and the actions. That's why is the heart corrupt, the action corrupt. The heart is sound, the actions are sound. Make sure that you understand those. Make sure that you care about freeing your heart from all these negative feelings and uh, uh, a negative attitude. Fill it with goodness. يَعْلَمِ اللَّهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ خَيْرًا يُؤْتِكُمْ خَيْرًا If Allah sees so much goodness in your heart, He gives you good. This hadith shows you the importance of caring about your heart. أَهَمِّيَّةِ الْعِنَاءِ بِالْقَلْبِ وَصَلَاةِ You care about the thing that, that will bring goodness to your heart. Don't poison your heart. You know how you poison your heart? With your eyes, with your ear, with your tongue. If you speak too much, if you see things that's haram, if you hear the haram, if you participate in the haram, if you think about the haram, all this poison you bring to the heart. Care for your heart to keep it always. Don't attach your heart to something haram. Attach your heart to what is halal, what's lawful. There is a flush, he didn't mention what it is. So you think, what is that in the heart that's so important? Then in the end he said, it is the heart. What's that piece of flesh in your, in your body? That if it's corrupt, everything is corrupt. If it's good, everything is good. He said it this way so you can get you thinking to show you the importance of it. And he said, mudgha is like a flesh, a piece like the the mudgha the tumdagh, يعني. Why it is it is small? You might not pay attention to it, but there is so much in it. يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم. وَأُزْلِفَتِ الْجَنَّةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ غَيْرَ بَعِيدٍ هَذَا مَا تُوْعَدُونَ لِكُلِّ أَوَّابٍ حَفِيظٍ مَنْ خَشِيَ الرَّحْمَنَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَجَاءَ بِقَلْبٍ مُنِيبٍ That's the point. In the Day of Judgment, the one who survived, the one who comes with these sound hearts. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said, Al-Qalb malikul a'da, Al-Qalb is the king of the body. If the king is good, the soldiers are good. If the king is corrupt, the soldiers are corrupt. One of the benefits from the hadith, that Al-Halal is clear, and the Haram is clear. The Sharia is clear. That's why the major things in Islam are so clear. There is no doubt for matter. Anything related to Allah, to the Aqeedah, to the principle of Iman, of faith, the principle of Islam, Qawaidul Islam, it's so clear. Usually the doubtful matter are the branches, but not the major principle in Sharia. Same thing with the Haram. The great sins in Islam, the Shirk, the Kufr is clear, well defined. There's no doubtful matter about it. The major sin in Islam are clear. And that's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. The minor sins, maybe there will be here and there debate over it. From this hadith we know that bringing to your heart what will corrupt the heart is so dangerous because can lead to 
destruction, to, to destroy you in the akhir. And destroying the heart means destroying the deed. So the wise person always check his heart. Especially my brothers and sisters, we're living in a time of fitan, trials. Don't expose yourself to things that you can't control. Don't expose yourself to doubts that you can't refute. Don't expose yourself to desires that you can't control. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم and the hadith reported by Imam Ahmed رحمه الله and the Sheikh Al-Albani said it's hadith sahih Al-Qalb was called Qalb min taqallubi because it flipped قال about flip and Al-Qalb is like a feather hanging on a tree the wind comes and carry it and flip it left and right that's how your heart can flip easily that he can turn your heart and you wouldn't believe in it after you already believed in it. You, you, you can't flip your heart. Something you believe, you believe in Allah and tomorrow, billah, you don't. You should be very careful what you expose your heart to. Wabi Sahib ibn Ma'bad said, I came to the Prophet and in my mind, I will not leave anything good unless I will ask the Nabi about it. And I will not leave anything bad unless I will ask Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wow, that means it's a long night, you know. Every good and bad you will ask about. I came and the Nabi Sallallahu surrounded with people asking him. And he said, I start moving my, them left and right, breaking my way through them. فَقَالُوا يَا وَاصِبَةِ Come down, Ya Wasiba. Come down. He said, leave me. I want to come closer to the Prophet Sallallahu There is no one more beloved to my heart to be so close to him like him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, دَعُوا وَاصِبَةِ Let Wasiba comes. Come near. Ibnu Ya Wasiba. Then when he came to the Prophet ﷺ, the Nabi ﷺ knows he is supported by the angels and the Allah SWT telling him the unseen, which is nobody knows what's in the heart and the mind of Wasiba except Wasiba. But the Nabi ﷺ knew and he said, before Wasiba open his mouth and ask all these long list of things, the Nabi ﷺ give him the answer. قال استفتي قلبك استفتي نفسك استفتي قلبك واستفتي نفسك Al-Bir-Mat-Ma-Anna-Ilayhi-Nafs-Wa-Tarad-Dada-Fi-Sadr-Wa-In-Aftaka-Al-Nasu-Wa-Aftawk-Thalathan-Sallallahu-Alaih
So these are some of the lessons that I want to share with you tonight in relation to this hadith. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his names and attributes to benefit us from what we have learned. And um, we're about to pray Aisha in a little bit.